Brian Bedford. Yeah. Brian was an extraordinary and unique kind of actor director, and I remember Lady Gay Spanker. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that just for the name. Yes. Right, <laughs> Lady Gay Spanker. Tell me a bit about Brian and the world he came from oh, and what Brian. he taught you. Well, Brian, Brian was a, a dear, dear friend. Uh, I loved him, and he, he just passed away this January. Um, he was 80. And uh, he was rarefied, ah, Bri. He, his connections, you know, because tradition, you know, comes from traditio, I think, Latin, which means to be passed down for safekeeping, I think, I think. And so he, this is a man who was, his mentor was John Gale Good. He worked with Noel Coward. He, he worked with Mike Nichols. He worked with these extraordinary people. The plays he saw when he was 18, you know, Birmingham rep, whatever, you know, went into his being. So he brings that. He, you know, I did about four Noel Cowards with him. You know, I did, I did, I've done about five Tennessee Williams with Miles. I've done about four Noel Cowards and three other comedies with Brian. We did School for Scandal. He was not directing that one, but we did Noises Off, London Assurance. And how would you describe that style of theater? Well, you know what? He did not like the word style. He never used the word style. He talked about the world of the play, and he tried to create a world in which these people, this was the way they spoke and behaved. It was natural to them to say, Oh, but that I. affects then your relationship with the audience, your relationship to the other characters, your relationship to how the narrative is revealed. It makes it truer because it doesn't seem like you're putting on an act. It means when I say, good night, you foolish bird, <coughs> in <laughs> whatever, a blithe spirit, it's really because I am saying that's, I talk to the animals and I would like them to shut up. But that is encased within a relationship of that character to the language, that character to metaphor, yes. that yes. character to yes. how you address other people, yes. not in, let's not say the down and dirty kind of, hey, how are you doing? Yes. But it's encased with a number of yes. layers of ideas yes. about relationships, language, people, cultural society, mm -hmm. romanticism, mm -hmm. yes. and class. Yes, all those things, all those things. And, 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 and you're saying you don't act those things, you just try to inhabit well, what is said? He would give you notes like saying, oh, we wouldn't say it, the accent would be on this. Like, you know, well, for one thing, it's always weekend, right? In that time period, you don't say the weekend, you say the weekend. Or, or a colloquial phrase that he would say, oh, no, we actually say it like this. I would never have dreamed to say that phrase with that inflection. Um, but it's also more about him wanting them to be real people who live this life in this time, in this place in history, and what they are used to, and what they are accustomed to. And so if somebody, you know, it's like, you, you know, it's very hard to do, like, you know, if you're doing an Ibsen, and you modernize it, and somebody puts the hat on the chair, and you go, what's that hat doing there? Or why is there a fork in the garden in Chekhov? So Sh but Sean is, is applying an intense amount of knowledge about that time, the expectations, the people in the class, into the appreciation of that. I mean, I bring back, Trying to. we did a restoration exercise in theater school, and Alan, he was, a, he was a designer, he directed it. And I went, oh, I don't want to do a restoration with a designer. But Alan, now gone, did a brilliant thing. He said, look, here's, the, here's, the, here's how the windows worked. Here's the proportion of the windows. Here's, and why it's a proportion of this window is because that's what meant a lot to them, mm -hmm. this proportion. So instead of going, oh yes, in restoration, I'm going to you stand know. like this, he was saying, well, I'll stand like that because this is well, what they were also, aspiring and to. And what you're wearing. For example, if you're doing um, 18th century, 17th, with uh, you're wearing a corset dress with a bell sleeve. You don't stand like this because you're not showing off the line of the sleeve. A lot of it was for how you were revealing yourself or how you were, you were wearing it. It wasn't because oh, that's what they do. It's because don't I look good when I do this? You can see the line of my dress. You can see my small waist. You can see, or men in, in Elizabethan times with their calves. It was all about the calves. So that's why they had the pumpkin pants to show off the leg so that you were revealing certain things that were attractive, that were sexual, that were enticing. 
So it was all about, you look at the paintings, you go, oh, this is, like you look at any picture in the 40s, right? The women are all standing with their legs like that. You know, one leg in front because that's where the knee, the skirt comes to the knee. So you look in the mirror because you want to see how does this look from all angles? And as Clifford Williams in theater school said, when all else fails, show off the frocks. <laughs> you know, but also because you have to be walking in them. So you can't go lump and take huge, large steps in a gown that you're meant to glide in. So Brian Bedford then brought what to that direction knowledge. that, say, a Paul Thompson wouldn't be able to bring? Well, he just brought his knowledge. Now, Brian was from, you know, Yorkshire. So, I mean, you know, he came from humble beginnings. But he, he, went, he was determined to go to theater school. He went without telling, he went, auditioned without telling his parents, and when he got it, he told them. And he went to theater school, and at that time you had to do RP, receive pronunciation in the theater school. So he stopped talking like that, and he acquired his, his voice, which has become more North American over the years. Um, but he had the knowledge of, he was in Britain when Odette's and all these great playwrights were coming out. And, uh, of the 20th century, and uh, very exciting times. So he brings all that into the room as well. Also, he's, he was a lovely man. He had very high standards. And you, you know, our first run, funnily enough, after our first run of Blythe Spirit, we were exhausted because he wants you to speak quickly or not, but think accurately. And, and uh, it was very precise. You know, I remember we were joking, you know, he'd say, I don't know, the... The, the, the something's too shiny, and oh no, no, now the teapot's too big. But it was all part of his taste, and ultimately the theater's taste. It's subjective. It is subjective. It's all about taste to me. I, uh, to me, I go, right, not my cup of tea, but it's somebody else's. You know, that performance that I thought was wonderful, the person beside me just didn't like it. That person that that person thought was extraordinary, I thought, mm. So it's, to me, it's subjective, but Brian, he was painstaking, and he, uh, he enabled actors. You know, I think it's different. It's, it also depends on your personal relationship with that director. You know, that's why some people love working with so-and-so, and some people love working with him. He was challenging, um, but he encouraged you to rise above. Let's sail into... Is that, is and it's it comic sense, okay? The one thing, too, yeah. about watching Brian Bedford, more than anyone I learned from him, is how he adored his audience, and they adored him. It was not self, you know, as Patsy Wodenberg would say, you know, first person, you know, in here. It was, I am here because of you. I'm here to share with you. And so he, he you were in a three-way relationship. It was you, Brian, and the audience, and they were included, always. And it wasn't necessarily pandering to them, because he didn't patronize his audience. He expected them to, to get his subtle joke, or his look, or his, and they did, because it was very clear. Um, and his comic timing was extraordinary. Except, you know, and when you did something, I remember first opening a, a Private Lives were in previews, and he said, don't be so melodramatic. And there was this huge laugh. He said, what did you do there? What was that? And I said, oh. Or I said, don't be so melodramatic. And I did, I did something like this. I was in a backless gown or something, and I said, don't be so melodramatic. <sighs> and turned my back to show my backless gown and a whiff of smoke going up. So it was a totally melodramatic action right after don't be melodramatic. He said, oh, great, fabulous. 